and we're going to get started. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us on our webinar today called Maximizing Your Abrasives. This is the third of six webinars we're doing in a series. On the screen now, you will see our upcoming webinars. Hand sanding series, uh, there's going to be two of those, uh, with one part being Sanding 101, the other one for the ultimate finish. And then the final one is Solid Surface, which is a big problem for a lot of people. And those are the dates, and we really appreciate everybody that's uh, participated in these webinars. It's definitely new for us. Um, I want to give a shout out to Alan Bopart, who is our marketing manager that really put all this stuff together for us and really uh, educated our sales team on how to use Zoom and, and these webinars. So what I'm going to do is after I get through one section of this, which is going to be the abrasive grains, I will stop at that point to see if there's any questions. So as the webinar goes on and we're looking at about 30 minutes or so, it's not a terribly long webinar. Just please uh, be typing your questions. Don't think I'm ignoring them, but we're going to stop kind of in the middle, answer questions, and then at the end, uh, we'll answer once again. So let's get started. The topic of today's webinar is maximizing your abrasives. And when we talk about maximizing abrasives, what we're really talking about is bringing together that mix of getting the best possible abrasive life that you can while at the same time achieving your finish. And when I put this one together, what I wanted to focus on for it is uh, some of the key elements or key uh, materials that go into making a wide belt and how that affects your finish as far as your longevity is concerned as well. Heat. I really like this slide. I hope this burns into your brain the word heat. I'm going to talk a lot about heat today and our desire and the things we can do to reduce that heat. Remember one thing. Heat is the enemy of coated abrasives, sandpaper. Heat is to sandpaper what kryptonite is to Superman. Um, you introduce heat, things start going the wrong way. Uh, the first thing that happens when you introduce heat into the abrasive process, it starts loosening up those resins. And the resins are very critical as that is the, uh, the additive that's gonna hold that grain down to the paper. So anything we can do to reduce heat in sanding is critical. Always be thinking about heat and how it affects your processes. This is an overview of the things we're going to be discussing. Uh, key considerations when picking an abrasive material for an application. We're going to focus on a, basically a couple of things today. Number one are types of grains. There's aluminum oxide, silicon carbide, aluminum zirconia, ceramic alumina, garnet, and emery. And I'm going to give you a good breakdown of each of those and where they're best applied. We're going to discuss abrasive material backings. So you've got paper, cloth, film. We're even going to discuss a little bit about foam. That is considered a backing in some instances. And we'll be covering things such as the weight of paper and cloth. Why being the heaviest of all the materials to coat abrasives to. And a weight is the lightest paper out there that you can coat an abrasive to. Before we start talking about the grains, which will be our first part of the webinar, there's a second term, each one thing that I want you to really concentrate on. The second thing that everyone who ever does sanding, especially on wood, is the term friable. And one thing I really want to preface as we go through this webinar is most of the people that have registered for this webinar are in the woodworking industry. Although at UNITA, we certainly service every market that could possibly use coated abrasives, including metal, solid surface, um, plastics, leather, you name it. We sell to all those markets. That being said, the majority of UNITA sales are still heavily in the woodworking market. So we do focus heavily on that. And our partner in crime in all this is Ecomont. Ecomont is a manufacturing manufacturer of coated abrasives in Sweden. And there's some joint uh, collaboration between them and Ecomont. Uh, you need is actually a shareholder in Ecomont, so we uh, synergize very closely together all the time. 
Um, so a lot of the information I get is from Ecomont and we approach woodworking probably a little bit different way than a lot of companies do. But I, I just want to, uh, to preface that. So a friable grain is an abrasive grain that fractures and exposes new sharp points within the same grain. It's just that simple. So what I have here in this, um, in this diagram, albeit it's, it's kind of a rough diagram, Abrasive grains, obviously, I'm circling this yellow one here. Abrasive grains, obviously, aren't shaped perfectly like a triangle. That would be just great if they were. They're typically very jagged. Um, some abrasives have a wider base at the bottom than others. Uh, if you looked at aluminum oxide grain and compared to silicon carbide, they do look a little different. But the one thing that all abrasive grains have in common is they start out sharp. And I'll show you a little bit more how that happens when we look at the uh, actual coating of abrasives. But what happens when you start sanding? This always happens. This tip that I'm pointing at here on this yellow grain is gonna get broken just from pressure and just from the sanding process. Same thing is gonna happen on this gray grain. And what I have separated here is this yellow grain is we're gonna talk about it as, is, as if it's a friable grain. We're gonna talk about this gray grain as being a dull grain. And as we get into the description of each abrasive, that'll make more sense to you. So when you're talking about friability and the ability for a grain to crack and resharpen, what basically happens is you have this big grain that I'm circling here, and you follow that yellow line, it brings you right over to these two. So what's happened here is as we're sanding and through the process and actually under very light belt tension, which is key, because keep in mind, we're trying to eliminate heat. What creates heat? Friction. The more belt tension you put on a sander, the more friction you're creating. When you're sanding with a five inch DA and you lay into that, into that sander to get more cut, that's fine, but what you're really doing is creating, creating more friction. And with friction, you're creating heat, and with heat, you're gonna start breaking down your abrasives. So as these abrasives are running and this grain here is cracking, it's basically splitting in off that same grain into two sharp points. So this grain has become this and so forth and so on. As this one cracks, it's going to have two sharp grains left, or two sharp tips. Now this one here is after this tip breaks, it becomes dull. So it starts to flatten out at the top rather than resharpen. Now let me be clear, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with this grain down here. It's just for woodworking, we don't like dull grains. We try not to use anything that's dull in woodworking. As far as Ecomont's philosophy, Unita's philosophy, is it's simple. We're simply manufacturing a cutting tool. It's no different than a router bit. It's no different than planer knives on a planer. All we've simply done is taken thousands of little knives and we've glued them to something, either film, cloth, paper, that is your delivery system for this cutting tool. Now ask yourself a question. If you're cutting something, do you prefer to use a sharp knife or do you prefer to use a dull knife? Our philosophy is you should always be using a sharp cutting tool. These pictures that you see here are real pictures. They've been mag. What we simply did was took pictures of grain that has been cut with a friable grain we took pictures of a, of a part that's been cut with a dull grain. We then magnetized that look 40 times. The way that grain should look to you is as if you bundled a bunch of straws together and you're looking down at the top of it because that's exactly what this top picture looks like. Now, when I see this and you get this result because we have a very sharp knife that's slicing through that wood, it's slicing through it. What that has done for you is it's opened up all of these grains very consistently. When you put stain on that picture there, you're gonna get a beautiful, very clear, very consistent color. That's because we have shaved all the grain off and opened it up. What's happening here with this dull grain, and again, there's nothing wrong with a dull grain as long as you use it in the right applications, which in our opinion is not wood. When you use a dull grain, what you basically are doing is plowing through this wood. It is very similar, when we try to educate people, we discuss plowing a field. 
you know how when you plow a field, you're cutting some of that dirt down and the rest of it's piling up, which the piling up is basically an analogy of laying this grain back down because that's what's happened. You plow through the wood, you shave this area down here off nice and, and clean. So you're going to get a good color penetration there. What's going to happen here where you've laid that grain down? We all know what happens when you lay grain down, you add water to it, which is in your finish. It's going to pop. So you're going to get a lot more raised grain you have to sand. And most importantly, what this is, this dull area here, this, this flattened area is probably going to be very blotchy. We run into this a lot with maple where we see someone at an account that has a lot of the, you know, maple is very popular. Well, I'm getting a lot of blotchiness in maple, but you know, we know it's the wood. It's not necessarily true. You really need to evaluate your braces. If you're getting a lot of blotchiness, a lot of it may be due to the fact that you're using a dull cutting tool rather than a sharp one. Okay. Now, electrostatic coating. I want to mention how we coat the abrasives because it does play into how we're able to run cooler. In the old days, if you look at the left, this pile of grain, pictures of, uh, you know, diagrams of grain over here. In the old days, the way they coated sandpaper, if you can imagine this bottom blue band, just picture that being a conveyor that's running, you know, the length of the screen. In the old days, you laid down the backing, which was either cloth or paper, and you put resin on it. And then you had a gravity feed system. Gravity feed is simply the best analogy. It's like taking a salt shaker and shaking grain out onto that, that backing with resin on it. That's the old way of doing things. And unfortunately, what that created for you is a very inconsistent coating. Because here you've got a grain that's the, the tip is sticking down instead of up. So the flat spot is sticking up. That's not going to sand very well. This one, you get much more of the tip of the abrasive. But you kind of got what you got when you were doing gravity feeding to, to create sandpaper. Now, with electrostatic coating, it's just a whole new process that really revolutionized sanding. And it's been around for a long time. And in fact, I don't know of many manufacturers that do gravity feeding anymore or, or coating. They typically all do electrostatic. So with electrostatic coating, what's happened is you, you, you've introduced an electrostatic charge. The beautiful thing about that is what we're doing now, we've reversed the system. This conveyor now at the bottom, we've, we've just laid, there's lots of loose grain on that conveyor. And that conveyor is moving through the process. On top of it, up here, is now where the cloth or the paper or the film backing is with resin on it. With that electrostatic coating process, what's happening is creating this charge and all these grains with these arrows going up, they're laying down. They're simply just flying up there and sticking onto the back of that paper. But the, the key to the whole thing is as it's pulling those grains up, it's pulling the heavy side up first, the bold side, which is perfect because you want that bold side sticking to the resin, leaving your nice sharp tips exposed. So you can see from the diagram to the left to the right, look how consistent these grains are on the coating process compared to this. The reason that plays into you being able to maximize your abrasives is if you have your sharp tips up, that's giving you a much better opportunity to run cool. A lot less chance of creating heat from all these these flat surfaces that are gonna now try to cut your work, your work uh, substrate. Now let's get into grains. And as we talk about grains, you're gonna t I'm gonna talk about friability again and heat. Most everyone on this call, I'm sure, has heard of aluminum oxide. It's typically called AO in the industry. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that most every grain used now, whether it's aluminum oxide or anything else we talk about, these days, most every grain used to create or to manufacture coated abrasives is made in a lab. They're all synthetic. That means it gives us a lot of opportunity to make these grains do what we want. Now, I want to have a quick disclaimer here. Ecomont makes all of our sandpaper for us. I've been with the company going on 19 years and there's still a lot of things I don't know. And that's simply because so much of this is proprietary. So when I start talking about pink and white aluminum oxide, it's very unique. A lot of companies only manufacture using brown aluminum oxide. And there's a very good reason for that. 
brown aluminum oxide or aluminum oxide in general is the number one used grain in all coated abrasive manufacturing. I don't care if you're sanding or grinding or polishing metal, plastic, rubber, leather, you name it, the odds are the majority of the time you're going to be using aluminum oxide. The other grains we're going to talk about are certainly uh, used quite a bit as well, but the number one selling grain is aluminum oxide. And going even further than that, the number one used grain in the industry is brown aluminum oxide. That is the most common aluminum oxide grain. The problem with brown aluminum oxide, it is not engineered to be friable. It is that, that grayish color grain I was showing you earlier in that diagram. Once that tip breaks and cracks, brown aluminum oxide starts to flatten out. It, it starts to have that curved effect rather than cracking and resharpening. Very good reason for that. Aluminum oxide is heavily used in the metalworking industry. As much as we love wood, wood is still nowhere near the market value for sandpaper that you have with metal, automotive, and some other things, especially metal. Um, it is between metal and automotive, that is where the majority of abrasives are used. So it makes sense to use a brown aluminum oxide because brown does great on metal. You like that dulling effect on metal because metal is very hard and it, it can break a grain down really quick. So the brown aluminum oxide is very strong, but it's not, it's not friable, so it doesn't refracture. But what it does, it wears very slowly as it's running. So having that dull grain gives it a lot of life on metal. But again, we're talking about a very hard substrate compared to wood. Even at the hardest wood you can find, it's still considered soft compared to metal. So what Ecomont has done is taken this whole thing into a completely uh, different direction. And not to say there are not other manufacturers of sandpaper doing this, certainly there are. I think um, probably nobody utilizes the white and pink AOs as much as Ecomont simply because our focus is strictly on wood. When we convert for metal, we don't typically use an Ecomont brand because it is designed for wood. We typically use some other brands in order to, uh, to fill our, our metal orders. So brown aluminum oxide is dull. The next move up from that is pink aluminum oxide. At this point, that grain has been engineered to be friable. It will crack and resharpen under relatively light pressure. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about light pressure because again, let the machine do the work, let the sander do the work, don't add pressure. Even on a wide belt machine, if we go into an account, they've got that machine set at 100 PSI because a lot of times these duller grains, guess what? you need more pressure to get them to cut. Because they're not friable, they're not resharpening, you have to add pressure to get the cut. When you add pressure, what are we adding? We're adding friction, we're adding tension, we're adding heat, and then you're gonna start breaking down your abrasives. Pink aluminum oxide is gonna crack and resharpen. You're gonna crack it, get two new sharp exposed points. Now, it is not as pure as the white aluminum oxide, and what makes these more pure? is the fact that it all has to do with one of the ingredients, bauxite. And that's how they're adjusting the pureness of the grain. It's how they treat that going into the process. So pink aluminum oxide is friable, but it takes a little more pressure than it would say to get white aluminum oxide to crack and resharpen. So basically the way to look at this is in our coarser grits, as far as applications for brown aluminum oxide, there's certainly a good use for that in wood for abrasive planing where you really have to hog a lot of material off. There you're not so worried about finish. You're worried about how much stock removal can you get and how quick can you get it. And brown aluminum oxide is good for that. It's good for abrasive planing white wood. You're typically gonna see the use of that from us in grits uh, eight, 24 up to say 120. 120 is still considered a stock removal grit. We start considering finishing to be at 150. And hand sanding a disc and sheets anywhere from 60 to say 120 grit is where we would want to utilize more of the brown aluminum oxides. And again, brown aluminum oxide is excellent for many, many metal applications. Um, tons of different metals that you can finish, grind and polish with, with brown aluminum oxide. With pink aluminum oxide, again, um, this, this information is very proprietary towards 
towards Ekamont. So I don't want anybody to misconstrue that when I say every 120 grit we have is pink ale, I can't say that. I don't know the mixtures they're using. I just know the way they do it, it works. And I know that we uh, heavily use pink and white AOs. In my mind, a pink AO would be around 120 grit and finer because it's still giving you a cut down grit and it's still fracturing and resharpening. White AO, when you really get into finishing, that is perfect for sanding in between coats of finish, for instance, because it is gonna break down much quicker. But when you're sanding a finish, for instance, you want that grain to break down relatively quick so that you don't risk sanding through. And white AO will often be used on the final wide belt sanding head on white wood anywhere from 180 to 240. So let's say you have a forehead machine and you're sanding 80 grit, 120, 180, then 220. For the 180 and 120 for sure, we're not nearly as concerned about that final finish as we are with the last couple of heads. So on those, we're gonna use something to give us as much life as we can and still get us to the next step and, and leave a scratch that can be removed from the next head. But when we get down to the last couple heads, especially that last one, what we're really looking for here is especially on, on parts such as face frames and five piece doors, where you get a lot of cross grain because of that rail style system. What we really want is to soften that cross grain as much as we can. So we definitely want to use a very friable grain on that. So it does leave the scratch you need to get the color, but it's soft enough that when you have to orbit sand this out, either by hand or with a big pad orbital, that that cross grain comes out much easier and under a lot less pressure, which will help us reduce the heat again and keep it running cool. So aluminum oxide is gonna be the number one grain. We really utilize pink and white aluminum oxide as some other manufacturers do. It's gonna give you that refracturing and cool running ability. Silicon carbide, very important grain. The funny thing about silicon carbide is it is a nine on the Mohs hardness scale and a diamond's 10. So silicon carbide is the next hardest thing to a diamond. I think when this stuff was actually created, somebody was trying to make a synthetic diamond. The thing about it though, is as hard as silicon carbide is, it's also very brittle. So it cracks and breaks down at a very fast rate, much quicker than aluminum oxide. That makes it a perfect grain to do a lot of finishing. Sanding in between coats of silver, you want that. You don't want a grain that's gonna hang in there forever because it's gonna cut through your finish. You want it to crack, put that scratch in there, denib that part and, and crack again and move on and run cool. It's, we use it heavily and a lot of companies do, a lot of our customers do on the last head of their sanding process. It's the same concept as when I discussed using a friable white aluminum oxide. It's gonna, leave you a much softer scratch that's going to be much easier to take out. If you had used a brown aluminum oxide, for instance, on your last head and left a 180 grit scratch, it's going to take a lot more work to remove that because it's a more rugged grain, it's cutting more aggressively, it's not nearly as soft. So it's going to be much more difficult to get out. Okay, let's see. We have uh, two different kinds of silicon carbide. One is black, one is green. Um, green silicon carbide is just a little bit harder. It is considered a premium silicon carbide. We have a couple of products. One in particular uses black silicon carbide, the other is green. The green silicon carbide is more expensive and most of our customers can typically get where they need to be using a standard uh, black silicon carbide. We just have kind of a special product that the settings and stuff have to be just right to really utilize that. But on silicon carbide, uh, you're gonna do a lot of hand sanding with that and grits 150 grit and finer. Again, think of silicon carbide, think of finishing. It's not that often on wood, at least, that you would use that on white wood other than the last head. And grinding and polishing stone and marble. Next to a diamond, there's no other grain that you can really use for that. And what you're gonna find in stone and marble is a lot of companies do use diamond abrasives it is probably the best way to do it, except for it's very expensive. If you've got a very large shop and they tend to be more wasteful, you'll probably want to stick to a silicon carbide, but it's perfect for polishing stone and marble. And titanium, extremely hard exotic type metal, but for whatever reason, silicon carbide does an absolutely great job on that because one thing titanium is bad about is burning and burnishing. 
and psyllium carbide is, is a grain that will, will definitely do the best for you on that. Okay, now the next uh, slide is gonna be about uh, alumina zirconia. Now, from us, if you're working with us, we're gonna never bring anything to you typically other than aluminum oxide or silicon carbide. To us, the next few grains I'm gonna talk about should really most often be used only in metalworking. Now there is an application for aluminum zirconia in wood. And the one thing to keep in mind about aluminum zirconia is it is friable. You remember we talked about the cracking and resharpening. This grain is friable. The difference between this and say a pink and white aluminum oxide though, this takes an extremely hard substrate to crack it. Now, if you're sanding with zirconia and you don't crack it, and it can't crack and resharpen, which means the surface it's sanding is not hard enough to crack it, then what's gonna happen, it's just gonna start to dull out just like a brown aluminum oxide would. And then what you're gonna find is you're gonna start losing your cut, doing damage to the wood, you're gonna take that belt off. Now you got a belt hanging up over there that you paid a lot of money for, it's pretty much glazed over and can't be used when actually if you had a way to crack that grain back open you could keep right on running uh, but unfortunately in, in woodworking you're not going to run you know a piece of metal through that machine to crack the grain back open wouldn't be a smart thing to do it would create a fire or something so our best uh suggestion is you stick with aluminum oxide now there are as i mentioned some applications where abrasive planing of hardwoods is um is, is necessary using an aluminum oxide zirconia and the reason we say that is, is when you're abrasive plane, your main consideration there is really heavy, heavy stock removal. So you may be gluing parts up, be gluing strips up to make a panel. Um, it may just be rough lumber. And sometimes you'll run that, most of the time you're running that stuff through a blade planer. The problem is you take a hardwood like a hickory or some maples. If you run that through a blade planer, your traditional just standard blade planer, those really, really hardwoods will sometimes chip out, almost like taking a, a chisel to a piece of concrete. When you abrasive plane, meaning you're doing a lot of stock removal with a coated abrasive, you don't get that chipping out effect. And that's why there are times when you're gonna want to abrasive plane using sandpaper, and sometimes zirconia is a better fit for that, especially on very, very hard woods. If not, we do have heat treated aluminum oxides that do a good job as well. So think aluminum uh, zirconia, often referred to just as zirconia in the business. That's a metal working grain for the most part. It is especially effective for grinding stainless steel. That's what it's very, very well known for. Ceramic alumina, better known in the industry simply as ceramic. Now, everybody's got their opinions for sure and every manufacturer's a little different. You will never hear anyone on the UNITA sales or tech team mention the word ceramic in the same sentence they mentioned wood, other than to say, we really recommend you don't use ceramic on wood. Um, it has been marketed heavily for wood by some manufacturers. We're not saying that that's, you know, for them that may be a good way to go. But um, for us, we just have other alternatives that we feel like give you a much better result. Ceramic is very similar to zirconia in that it is friable. So it does crack and resharpen. Unfortunately, again, it takes an extremely hard substrate to get that effect to happen. So if you're sanding wood, you're gonna start plowing through that wood if that grain does not crack and resharpen. Um, so, you know, that's our biggest concern with ceramics. We can get just about as much life from a good heat treated aluminum oxide and get a better result. Ceramic uh, was really designed, again, for metal in mind. It's really good for heavy to medium grinding of all types of metals. And the difference between ceramic and zirconia, uh, not even in addition to the fact it's manufactured a little differently, is that whereas zirconia typically stops at, say, a 120 grit, ceramic gets, goes a lot finer. So a lot of people can use ceramic to go as far as polishing, and it does a very good job on polishing stainless steel. But for our purposes where the grains are concerned, silicon carbide and aluminum oxide. In our opinion, you should be using zirconia and ceramic in the metalworking industry. We sell a lot of ceramic and we sell a lot of zirconia. We just sell them into the metal, the metal industry. We don't sell them to the wood industry. I just want to give a shout out to Emory and Garnet. These guys go back a long, long time. 
Um, they are two natural grains. They're mined. Emery is actually, uh, I'm sorry, garnet. Somebody switched my slides here. Garnet on the right there is typically mined up in New York State. I don't even know really to tell you the truth where garnet's being used much these days anymore. Um, it's definitely very seldom used in the coated abrasive industry now that we have all these synthetic grains that we have a lot more control over them. Garnet is friable. It will crack and resharpen, but it breaks down really, really quick. So you don't get much longevity out of that. Emery used to be used in what used to be called crocus cloth. It was really an inexpensive abrasive that you just use for touching up, things like that. You will see emery still used today, but it's mostly in uh, polishing compounds. Um, that's typically where, where that's used in this day and time. But you gotta love them, they're natural. Unfortunately, everything's gone to, oh, well, fortunately, actually, it's gone to synthetic grains because we can get it to do just what we want it to do. Now we finished with the, uh, that section of it. Let me see if we have any questions. Okay, is there a way we can do prior webinars? Uh, hey, James, Morlock, absolutely. Uh, we will get to that at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you can't hold on that long, if you shoot me an email at Curtis Hicks at unita.com, I will uh, get this uh, link to you that you'll be able to see all the webinars that we've had. And let's see, is there a way to download today's slide deck? Absolutely, Jane, we'll, we'll do that for you as well. Okay, that's the only question there. So we've talked about grains. That's one of the most critical things when you are deciding what to use to sand with. Do I use a silicon carbide? Do I use aluminum oxide? And I really encourage all of you to involve your, whoever's repping you for your sandpaper, whether it's a distributor rep, direct rep from the factory, have some discussions with them. Tell them that you, you know, you really want to investigate all the best things they have out there. Ask them about their, their abrasives. You know, what type of grain are you using? Is it a regular aluminum oxide? Can you give me something that runs a little cooler, that breaks down a little better, that resharpens? So let's get into backings. Lots of different kinds of backings. We're going to start with y weight polyester. That is the most durable, stiffest, thickest material that you can coat sand uh, grains too to create sandpaper. In polyester alone, you're gonna see on this section here, I have a YY and YX. When you see YY, that is 100% polyester. So that is gonna be the most durable backing you could have. Why use polyester? One reason, for instance, is let's say you're doing a lot of pine and you wanna wash your belts. You can't wash your belts if they're made of paper. You can't really, you shouldn't even really wash belts if they're made of 100% uh, cotton because that still can cause some issues. Polyester is completely waterproof. Uh, you can wash it, you can take a, go to a car wash and spray it down, do whatever you want to to it. Second reason you like polyester in some applications is because of how durable it is. If we're doing abrasive planing and we really have to hog a lot of wood off, we're gonna use that, that polyester back. Because that way, if a piece of wood happens to jab into it, something like that, you got a much better chance of that belt withstanding that and not busting and coming apart. It's used on heavy duty machine sanding. A good example of this would be for, from our standpoint, is if you are going to, let's say you have a forehead machine, 80, 120, 180, 220, and let's say you're making five piece doors. Let's say your style and rail is not perfect. Nobody's, you know, not everybody's is perfect. Let's say it's off 10, 20 thousandths. You do not want to hit that with a paper belt. You have much more chance on that first head with that part coming in with that offset on your styles and rails. You got a good chance that might bust that paper belt. So in that application, you need something strong. You need something that, that can handle that abuse. And that'll be a polyester back, maybe even just an x weight or a mix of cotton uh, cloth and polyester. But um, in, in those cases, it's, it's very, very uh, essential sometimes. Now, as far as wide belts go, we do have a saying at Unita, get to paper as fast as you can. So we're gonna use cloth in the beginning if we need to, to calibrate, but as soon as we can get to paper, we will, and I'll explain that in a minute. As far as cloth goes, the next one on the list is a, after Y weight and X weight is J weight cloth. The thing you have to understand is when you manufacture sandpaper, the jumbo rolls that come out, and ours are particularly 55 inches wide, 
all of it's stiff when it comes out. If you get a J-weight material, it didn't start that way. So you take this very stiff jumbo roll, and then we do what we call flexing, which means they take that whole jumbo roll and they rerun it, and it's going over these bars at 90 degree angles. That's how you flex it. Every bit of sandpaper goes through at least some type of flexing process. When you get to J-weight, you're really flexing it a lot more. Now, why would you want to flex your sandpaper? Well, if you need some type of flexibility uh, to get into a contour or something, you got to have something that's going to have some give to it. And we can determine how much give we give to that product just by how much we break it. Then the next question may be, why don't you crack and uh, make everything flexible? Well, the problem is every time that you crack that grain, which is how you're creating that flexibility, keep in mind it's already been made and now we're going to run it through this process. So when you crack that, that grain over those 90 degree bars, every time you break the grain, or the, I'm sorry, not the grain, you're cracking the resins, I apologize. Every time you crack that resin, you're also hurting the life of the abrasive because then you're gonna have, it's gonna start releasing quicker than it would be if you'd never cracked that resin, but you do need the flexibility. So just keep that in mind. J-weight, more flexible abrasives are gonna tend to have a little bit less life than a stiffer back abrasive would. So flexible cloth usually used almost always in narrow belts for mold sanders, profile sanders, uh, a lot of it's often used as well, hand sanding. Let's say you're making wooden chairs. You know, you have that little seat in there that's kind of carved out. A nice soft J-weight disc will get down in there and clean that out. In some applications, you have uh, such a tight profile that you need even more flexibility. So what do we do? We take that same material and we just keep breaking it. We flex it a couple more times or how many times is necessary to get a JF, which is an extra flexible material to get into even tighter profiles. We even go so far as to have a JFF. That cloth is so flexible that you can take it and just ball it up in your hand. And it's used in a lot of applications where you gotta really get into tight profiles. And again, that's always, almost always gonna be a, a narrow belt or on a hand sander. You would never, never see this typically on a wide belt. Very few exceptions with that, and nothing to really get into. It's uh, some processes that they use a J-Flex cloth belt just to get into some special finishing applications. Um, now let's get into paper. We're huge fans of paper, and I'm gonna tell you why. Anything that's cloth, whether it's X-weight, Y-weight, J-weight, J-F-F, doesn't matter, it's woven. So you've got one string going over another string, and you've woven the whole backing. Perfect for giving you durability strength. Problem is, if you take a cloth belt and sand it, say, out to 220, and you take that board and you look up in the light, every single time you're going to see a bit of a railroad-looking mark running down it. It's nothing defective. Probably won't even show up in the finish. But it's not perfect. And the reason that, that is is because that is a woven material. That line you're seeing running through there is the weave of that material. There's no getting around it. So, like I said, at Unita, our philosophy is you get the paper as quick as you can. When you coat sandpaper, when you put grain on paper, you're taking a much more precise and flatly pressed substrate and coating that grain to it. You're not gonna get any of those funny looking lines streaking down through your part that you'll get out of cloth. And also, our focus is always on heat. We hate heat. It's always on reducing that heat. Paper breathes a lot better. It's gonna run a lot cooler than cloth will run. So get to paper as quick as you can. Even if you have three, a four head machine, let's say you had a two head machine that just, a lot of times you have to run cloth because it doesn't track well. Perhaps you can only adjust one tension setting for the tracking and you can't adjust it for the belt tension. That can be an issue. But sometimes you have to run cloth because if it, like for instance, if the machine doesn't track well, you can't put paper on, it's gonna run off and blow. But even if you had like a forehead machine that's not in the greatest condition, if there's any way at least on that last head to finish with paper, you're gonna do yourself a big, big favor by doing that. So F weight paper, we typically use that to make wide belts and narrow belts in grits 40 up to typically 220. 
And then when we get into grits finer than that, say 320 and above, we're gonna go with an e-weight paper. And it's a little bit thinner than F weight, but it also, the thinner you can get, the better the finish is gonna be. So we use that strictly in grits 320 and above, and it's typically wide belt and narrow belts to do your finish sanding. Usually when we sell an, an e-weight paper, it's to sand in between coats of finish, either on like a Heisman by hand, on a stroke sander, but uh, it's typically strictly for finish sanding. C-weight paper. Once we go below E, everything else, we're talking about paper that's used either by hand or on handheld machines. You're not gonna make a wide belt typically out of a C, B, or A weight paper. C weight paper's perfect density and perfect thickness for a lot of the DA random orbit sanding that you have to do. Because it's thicker, it's gonna be a little more durable than the A and B weights. It's gonna give you a little bit more life because it's got that little more durability. It's not gonna be quite as flexible as an A and B weight. But a lot of papers out there are C weight, medium lightweight paper, and always for hand sanding. You're not typically gonna see a C weight paper in nine by 11 sheets. We certainly can do that. Other manufacturers can certainly do it. But typically when you're using cut sheets, nine by 11s, three and two thirds by nines, half sheets, whatever the case may be, you're typically taking and folding that paper up. So you want something that's really, really thin and easy to work with and fold. That's where your A and B weight papers come in. It's the lightest weight papers available, always used in hand sanding. A lot of those papers do are utilized in nine by 11 sheets to fold over and get into uh, profiles. A lot of the disc as well are made out of A and B weight paper. And a lot of the papers we use do have a latex in it, especially for the hand sanding. So it's a little bit of rubber in them. It doesn't make it waterproof, but it gives you a little more flexibility and durability. So, as our second component to making sandpaper that's critical to maximizing your abrasives, you have to put a lot of thought into the backing that you want that grain coated to. And it's very application specific. Sorry about that, I'm having a little issue here with PowerPoint, here we go. There are two other substrates that we coat abrasives to. The newest of all of them is film. It came out, I believe, sometime back in the 90s. And film has become a very popular substrate. It is even better than paper to coat to because that is a mylar plastic and you can make it perfectly flat. Paper's very flat and it's definitely a great way to go, especially considering we don't really do wide belts out of film. It's just too thin. There's just a whole lot of reasons why that doesn't work but film has turned out to be one heck of a product to use for hand sanding. It's strong, it's tear resistant, that backing is, and it's waterproof. So if you're doing solid surface, things of that nature, you need to spray some water, you wanna really take a look at film. Film is quickly becoming one of our top two or three back, uh, disc back materials that we're selling. We, uh, it's kind of a, a great, it's almost a cross between cloth and paper. You're getting the finish you would get from paper, yet you're getting a lot of durability of cloth. And there's lots of films out there. We alone have three different types. So film is used typically, majority of it is gonna be used on hand sanders, five inch, six inch, three by four cut sheet, automatic sanders. But film has also turned out to be a perfect material to run on pad orbital sanders. And when I say a pad orbital, if you have a wide belt machine and you come out of the back of that and you're gonna have an automated system to sand out that cross grain. A lot of times they're just big pads, like 17 and a quarter by 54, 10 inches wide by 45 or 44, whatever it may be. And that's either adhered with PSA or you clip it in. But nothing works better than that film to orbit out that, that uh, cross grain. We used to use paper, paper's thicker, and it doesn't bend as well around corners as that film will do. So film is perfect for these pad orbitals. Now you're starting to see planetary orbitals. There's a couple of companies now making them. So after you come out of the wide belt, you may see a series of about 20 different heads that are offset, just round, five inch round heads. Well, that needs a, a disc to put on it in order to get the orbital scratches sanded out. Film is the best product for that. We've had a lot of experience now on these planetary orbitals and it's done a very good job compared to paper. The final way to coat abrasives on the foam, this is nothing new to any of you. If 
you're using any kind of sponge in your shop now, you're using foam. Most uh, sponges come in half inch, five millimeter or 10 millimeter in thickness. The good thing about foam is extremely conformable and flexible and it's waterproof. So again, you can wet sand with that. We do have uh, foam products out now that have hook and loop on the back that you can easily attach to a three by four, five inch sander, six inch, 11 inch, eight inch, depending on what you're doing. And um, that's really revolutionized things a lot too, because now you don't have to do everything by hand with foam. You can do some of it on a machine. So those are all the different backings. Something I want to point out, when you start looking at the backing of your paper and, and or cloth or whatever the case may be, I want to point these things out because, you know, a lot of times when you're looking for help on your abrasives, you may be talking to someone on a telephone or, you, you know, you may not have a rep that comes in that often. The back of, of any material typically tells you a lot. For instance, uh, it tells you the backing type. So if I look at this blue belt on the right here, that JS997 tells me a lot. Most companies will use different nomenclature, but I, I know in this case, they're designating the back of that backing as being J with that J. So if somebody were to call me and say, yeah, I've got this material, it's called JS997 from Deer Fossil. I'm like, oh yeah, I know what that is. I know it because of the, the stuff that's written on the back. This is giving your grit, 80 grit. This is probably as KV, whatever number that is, it's probably a lot number. So if you're having an issue, the manufacturer may say, hey, what's the numbers on the back of that product? Because that's going to tell me the lot. This particular one in the middle, you see these arrows? That's very important because this could be a belt that's going to have a lap joint. There's two types of joints. You can use tape, which is universal, run either way. Lap has to run in a very specific direction. And those arrows are printed so that when the belt is made, that will point the direction that you need to run that belt in. This belt over here, for instance, that's paper. That A5 is a, is a lot number. Typically, this is actually one of our products, and typically on there, there'd be four or five, like A, B, C, and D number. Those numbers are important because they give us the lots. And a lot of times, just looking at the backing will tell whoever's trying to help you who the manufacturer is, um, which is very beneficial to someone trying to help you. So that's what nomenclature on the back of these belts mean. There's two other things I want to talk about. We've talked about in order to maximize your braces, we've talked about the type of grain, which is very critical to get the most out of your braces, whether it's silicon carbide, aluminum oxide, knowing when to use it. Secondly is the type of backing to maximize your braces. There are two other things we're going to talk about. First one being steration. So what is a steration? A steration, the best way to describe it, it most simplistic way to describe it, it's like taking soap, and covering the top of your abrasive with soap. Most sterations are a zinc sterate. There's also calcium sterates or some different things used. So this picture on the far right, in fact, I tell you what, let's look at the one on the far left. You see how it's got that cloudy look to it? Well, that's not actually the color of that sandpaper. It's probably red. What's happened is we've top coated that with the zinc sterate. And that's why it has that cloudy look. The zinc sterate in this particular product here in the middle, it doesn't have that cloudy look because that was put in the resin. There's two ways to do it. You can put your steration in the resins or you can put it on a top coat. I think it going into the resins is probably more durable, it lasts longer, but sometimes having that top coat of steration on certain finishes is even better because it, it quickly reacts and helps. The reason for steration, two things. Number one, remember it's like a soap, so it's giving you a lubricant. So as you're sanding with that DA sander or you're sanding uh, finish with a Y-belt machine, what tends to happen is as you're cutting wood or let's say you're sanding paint off of something, as you're sanding these things off, they tend to stick to the grains. And then what happens is as it's sticking to those grains, we get what the effect of we call loading. That grain starts loading up. What happens then? You start getting a bad finish. You either burn parts, you leave lines, you start getting streaks, lots of different things. That lubricant that we put on there, that steration, it gives it, it's basically nice and slick. It gives those splinters from the wood a place to slide out and exit from the, from the, from the sandpaper. And um, the second reason you use a steration, as we talked and talked and talked about, it is, it runs cooler. It greatly reduces the heat because it's reducing the friction. Now, your question is probably like, why don't we sterate everything? Well, 
Steration you're gonna find is mostly used when you're talking about finishing, especially in between coats of finish, things of that nature. Um, most all your five inch DA paper, C weight down to A is sterated because they know a lot of that's gonna be on finish. It's gonna be, uh, you know, lots of different stuff. It, discs are the most universal product. You're gonna use that on all kinds of things. But every time you do put a steration in there, you gotta keep in mind too, you're starting to fill that belt up, the spaces in between. And, a, and you will lose cut from that. You're not gonna get as much abrasive use out of that as you will if it's not sterated. So in all of our cut down grits and our white wood sanding, for the most part, we do not use sterations because we want to get the full cut out of that grain. We don't want to lose any of it to filling it with any kind of uh, additive. So steration is very important though. It's a very key factor in maximizing your braces in that it helps them run much cooler, helps them keep from loading. The second property that goes into making sandpaper, anti-static properties. When anti-static properties to be added to sandpaper were invented back in the 70s, it really revolutionized sanding. Because what happens when you're sanding, I mean, it's common sense will tell you. Let's talk about wide belts. You've got this wide belt running and it's sanding that surface. It's creating a lot of friction. What does friction do? It creates heat. What do we hate? We hate heat. So what's come about with this is that they've added properties to the belt. It can either be a spray that's sprayed onto the backing, or it could be an additive they put in the resins. There's different reasons for doing both. We won't get into that here. It's a bit technical. But um, what that anesthetic property does, it eliminates that static charge that's being developed from all that friction. If you look at the picture below here, that is a non-anti-static belt. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, where you look into your machines and dust is just sticking to it everywhere. That's because there's an electric charge and it's, it's attracting that dust. When you use anti-static properties and eliminates that charge, what's gonna happen is it allows your dust extraction to work correctly. Then the dust doesn't wanna lay and stick on things it's gonna be blown into that dust extraction system and taken away. Now, what you're gonna find is we don't see a huge need for anti-static properties in cloth. Where anti-static properties are most beneficial to you are in paper-backed products because that paper tends to create a lot more static electricity. And especially important when you get into your finer grits because that static can start leaving lines in your parts. So steration and anti-static are two additional additives that go into abrasives that also help maximize your, uh, your, your, your performance on abrasives to give you the, the longest life with the best finish. With anti-static, you're getting a much more dust-free surface. You're getting a dust-free sanding machines. You wanna keep as much dust out of the machines you can. Anti-static belts help with that. You get an improved sanding economy because your belts are gonna last longer. If you're sanding dust, if you're sanding a piece of wood and half of what you're sanding is the dust that was already on it from the sand you just did, then you're gonna, you're gonna lose life of that abrasive. It's creating a lot of heat. Uh, it's more com comfortable sanding conditions. It's much nicer to work in a clean environment than a dusty one. Without anti-static, dirty work pieces, dusty sanding machines, longer sanding process, and decrease in productivity. So in conclusion, to maximize your abrasives and get the most abrasive life and finish, we've looked at a few things. Selecting the proper grain for the application. Should you maybe be using silicon carbide or right now you're using aluminum oxide? I don't know. It's a conversation to have, either with uh, us if we're your supplier or with, uh, with your current supplier. Make sure you're uh, taking a look at all your options. Select the proper backing for the application makes a big difference on how well you can maximize your abrasives. Are you using paper where maybe you should be using cloth to get more life, vice versa. Maybe you're using cloth where if you use paper, the finish would last, it would be nicer longer and allow you to run that belt long. Utilizing additives such as steration and anesthetic properties when appropriate, you don't really have a lot of control over that. Uh, your abrasive manufacturer is putting these additives in in products that they deem is geared for that, that they know is gonna be using applications for it. Just make sure, especially on your paper bells, because there are some out there that are not anti-static. So these are just things you wanna check into. And remembering in all of this, 
The overall objective to maximize your abrasives is to reduce heat. That's our kryptonite. What can we do to reduce heat? That should always be what, what's on our mind. So let me uh, take a quick look here, see if there's any more questions. Okay, this one comes from Zachary. For finished sanding, what should be the determining factor for selling AB weight paper versus film backing? I'll tell you, Zachary, uh, if everything else being equal, what's gonna be your determining factor there is gonna be price. Film is typically more expensive than paper. It's a more expensive product to make. But what I would really keep in mind on this, if you're doing flat surfaces, you'll be fine with paper. If you're gonna have applications where you're gonna really get on the edges, you really wanna get a film for that because they're not gonna tear. It's almost impossible to tear that stuff. It's gonna hold up a lot more on the edges. And how many times do we throw abrasives away because the edges are bent up or they've gotten a little tear in them? Um, now, AB paper, you know, it's like with us, we have uh, probably more AB weight papers than C. Um, but comparing to film, that's obviously two different things. So that's really what I would look at is, and I would always run tests. Most anybody will give you samples. So just kind of get a good feel for it. Say, okay, this disc is 10% more, but I'm getting 20% more life. Um, from our standpoint, if you're working with us, we would sample you both in almost every situation because a lot of times with the braces, it just simply takes a lot of testing to figure out what's best for you. Uh, can you discuss wet dry sandpaper? Is it commonly made using silicon carbide? What is it best used for? That's from James. Uh, you're absolutely right that it's, um, it's, it's almost always silicon carbide. And wet dry paper, um, what that simply means, you can use it wet or dry. And it has to have a, even an A weight paper is, is probably most common for wet dry paper, but that backing has a ton of latex in it. That's what's making it waterproof. So in the woodworking industry, there is a use for wet dry paper, especially the silicon carbide you're talking about. Especially back in the old days, when there were a lot of polyester finishes. You would use silicon carbide in like a three and two thirds sheet on this, this big, uh, sander like a double pad sander it's hard to even find anymore it used to be called a sturgis sander and that's used to rub that polyester so if you're doing any kind of rub finish where it's still kind of wet tacky and that's on purpose in order to spread it to, to layer it to, to feather it out then you have to have a wet dry paper now that being said for instance solid surface you don't really want to use so much silicon carbide on that that's where your films come in very handy because they are wet dry as well. Now wet dry silicon carbide that um, James is mentioning there, it's heavily used in automotive for wet finishing on cars. And um, it's, have, it's used a lot on stone and marble wet. So you definitely need a wet dry paper if you're gonna be polishing stone and marble wet. Very good question. Okay, what else do we have here? Okay, and the, the question again is to follow up to that one is wood, metal, or both. Wood is very little wet dry paper used except with the exception of doing the rubbing in between coats of finish. Now, when it comes to, uh, and, and of course, when it, metal would be automotive or at least sanding in between coats of, of paint as you're trying to wet sand. So I would say in this case, you're going to see it wet dry a lot more in metal. And even going to that extent, when you're talking about backings in metal, that's why polyester is very popular too. If you're going to be white belt sanding, stainless, aluminum, what have you, 90% of those machines are running wet. So it's actually designed to be able to put water, flood water into that process to make it run a lot cooler. And then Paul wanted to know if we can get a copy of the presentation. Paul, absolutely. I'm gonna give you the website here in just a second for that, or you can always email me directly at curtishicks at unita.com and I'll get you uh, any information you want. We have to answer any other questions you might have. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So, and uh, I believe, unfortunately, I'm missing a slide here that had the website, and I apologize for that. There, I'm sorry, look at that, it's there. So, for any questions, email me at curtishix at unita.com. For webinar replays, go to www.sandpaper.com backslash past.webinars. And if you go to our site, you'll go sandpaper.com backslash webinars. That'll be for the next ones, and you can register for them there. 
So any other uh, information that you need, we'll be happy to help you with. You can find a lot of information at, at unita.com. We are, we really have an, an excellent website. It's got a lot of resources as far as videos, PDFs, MSDS sheets, a good breakdown of all of our materials. And one last thing before we end, you may be receiving a survey. We would really appreciate it if you can uh, to fill that survey out and send it in. Webinars are a relatively new thing for us and any of your feedback be as critical as you, as you can be. Any feedback you get from us helps us uh, do a better job at helping to educate you. And that is really our objective with these webinars. We're not really here trying to sell you something. We just want to help educate you so you can make the best decisions. Let me check just one more time to make sure we don't have any more questions. So I saw a couple come in. Okay, we do. Um, from James again, for belt sanding, for shaping carving tools, would you use zirconia? Yes, that's absolutely perfect uh, application for zirconia, James, is, is to shape tools. Uh, we see a lot of that in the knife industry, for instance, a lot of narrow belts, one by 72s and things of that nature. We have a little bit of slack of belt. Then you can take that, that carving tool over there and sharpen it up for you um, and also cut a shape into it. So it'll definitely do a good job of that. You may even want to look at a ceramic for that, but definitely needs to be a very strong cloth back product. So I think that's it. That's our story and we're going to stick to that. So we appreciate, really do appreciate everybody joining our, our webinar. We hope you, you uh, check out the next uh, series of them. There'll be a, a part one and part two for hand sanding and then solid surface. So thank you very, very much. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me at curtis6 at unita.com. If I can't answer your question, I promise you will find somebody that can. Thanks so much. Be safe out there and uh, hope to see all of you guys again soon in person. Thanks so much. <laughs>